This photo makes me sad. Really sad, actually. Sad because I see a broken system that very few understand the urgency of fixing. Sad because this is a first generation with a lower life expectancy than that of their parents. And sad because obese children will suffer physical and mental challenges that will stay with them for their entire lives. Low self-esteem, low self-confidence, anxiety, diabetes, and even cancer. The World Health Organization reports that there are over 42 million obese children under the age of five. 42 million. That's preventable and that's unacceptable. Physical literacy is the gateway to fixing the childhood obesity epidemic. Now, I wasn't an obese child, but I did come from dysfunction, which leads me to the, the transformative power of what we now define as physical literacy. I got my degree in human kinetics, which is the study of human movement. And professionally, I've spent the last 25 years facilitating personal reinvention through physical challenge, adversity, and victory. We have helped tens of thousands of people prioritize healthy living and being physically active. And it's been amazing. Physical literacy is just that. It's understanding the requirements to lead a physically healthy and physically active life. It's fallen by the wayside in the last decade, and in doing so, given rise to the ridiculous childhood obesity epidemic. To be clear, we can solve the childhood obesity epidemic if we can educate physically literate populations. Now, a leading researcher gives us five reasons for the decline of physical literacy, and we want to explore those not through the lens of shame, but through the lens of opportunity. What can we do as change agents? Because childhood obesity is not just reserved for children, it affects us all. After all, we are all children. Some of us are parents, aunts, uncles. We live in communities. Childhood obesity is all of our problem. So the first reason given for the decline of childhood obesity is screen time. It's reported that children today will spend an average of 7.4 hours in front of the screen. Smartphones, computers, video games, television sets, 7.4 hours. That 7.4 hours would normally be spent playing. Being outside, exploring, creating, discovering. We have prioritized entertainment over our health. We need to fix that. The second reason given for the decline of physical literacy is early sports specialization. I mean, we used to have seasons. There was fall, there was the winter, the spring and the summer, and it was a great opportunity to switch sports, meet new parents, meet new kids. It's not just about sports, it's about socialization. We are designed to move. Human beings are designed to move and we're designed to be social. But then we took it way overboard. Hockey parents. Yeah. I just don't understand those hockey parents. Now we have sports that go 10 to 12 months a year. And what's the result? Injury. Overuse injuries. We're hearing about them all the time in research. Also, now we've got kids that are dropping out of sports by the time they're teenagers. Why wouldn't they? We've sucked all of the fun out of it. And we've made it a job from 6 to 16 years old. Who wants to do that? That's not what sport is about. That is not what playing is about. That is not what physical literacy is about. The newest phenomenon, 20-something-year-olds wandering emergency room hospitals with anxiety. They don't even know why they're there. They're just anxious. That's on us. The third reason for the decline of physical literacy is generalist physical education teachers. Gone are the days 
where we had the teacher with the whistle and the clipboard who we all looked up to. And when they said jump, we'd work on it. And they've been replaced by people who have no education and very little resource and support to teach us physical education. Would this fly for science and math? If anyone saw me teaching math, I would hope they would say something. Because <laughs> that would be a disservice to their children. Which gives way to the next obvious issue, which is we'll just cut physical education out altogether. Think about this. In a time in our world where creativity and innovation are at the forefront of everything that we see, we are cutting out things like art and physical education that promote that and standardizing reading, writing, and arithmetic. We are producing sheep. And that's not healthy. We need to change that. We need to bring that back. And the last one, the final reason for the decline of physical literacy is fear. Fear that around every corner is a white van with a perpetrator in that that's going to snatch our children from us. Fear that somehow if our children are released from the confinement and imprisonment that we share into the world, they're going to be met with harm. We play upon that fear. Unknowingly, health-related issues will constitute over 98% higher almost 99% higher incidence to our children than the likelihood of them getting snatched or the likelihood of them getting hurt. So let's look at those five reasons again, not out of shame, but out of opportunity. What can we do in our circles of influence? What can we do to decrease screen time, to make sure that our kids are exposed to a variety of activities, not just sport, but a variety of activities and seasons? that we can make sure they have specialist education, that we can make sure that physical education is a priority as well as the arts in the school, and to make sure that we don't make our fears their fears. That's what we need to do. There are three main areas that we need to promote this message in the household, in schools, and in society. And let's start in the home because that's where physical literacy starts. I'll use myself as an example, because I should know better. But given the opportunity, pretty much seven out of seven days a week, my two boys, and I have two boys, and I love them, but I want to strangle them sometimes, they would choose to eat cereal and juice. Why? It tastes great. It's super easy. It's fast. It's quick. But what am I doing? What am I doing there? When they would go through this habit, we would notice poor behavior, bad grades, and really bad attitudes. Then we said, hang on a second, let's stop this madness. The daily recommendation for sugar is six teaspoons a day. Six teaspoons a day. This is multiplied over one week. So this is a week of the recommended sugar intake. Not that bad. I mean, when you, when you think about it, that's across all of your foods. Now, as a comparable, one can of cola has nine teaspoons of sugar. One can. So if your son, daughter, yourself has a can of cola, you've already exceeded the daily recommended average. Now, let's look at the average daily intake of sugar per day, which is 22 teaspoons. Multiplied over a week, here's what you got. Recommended, actual average. When you think about this, and you think about putting this in to your kid's stomach, and sending them off to school. What are we doing? We're not sending them off to succeed. We're sending them off to fail. I was sending my kids to school. Hi. I'm not kidding. Sugar has been proven to stimulate the exact same part of the brain as cocaine. I was sending my kids to school. Hi. And then having the audacity to march down and argue with the teacher. Well, I, well, I can't do something with that. He's great at home. <laughs> the problem is we don't want to see our children fail ever. It's well-intentioned. No parent, our parents' job is to make sure our kids have a successful foundation every chance we get. But we overdo it. 
Second story, my kid was three years old and we were sitting out in front of a waterfront and he was in his 17 point harness life jacket, walking down the riverfront looking for the next shiny rock when he tripped and fell. And he fell to his hands and knees and he looked over at us. We were all sitting on the beach and he started to cry. And just before we were about to call the National Guard, I said, no, 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 wait, everybody. Sit back, we got this. And I looked over at him and I said two words, stand up, stand up. And he looked over at me, I'll never forget it. He tears streaming down his eyes. It was kind of eating at me a little bit, but I was like, come on. So he pushed himself back up, brushed off his hands and continued to search for the next shiny rock. That is physical literacy. And in a literal term, it is teaching our kids to fail in our presence so that they can succeed when they fail in our absence, both literally and metaphorically. How can our kids succeed in the world if we're always there to catch them? They can't. Second place physical literacy needs to be measured is in school. So schools look at phys ed like a glorified spare, basically. It's a socialization experiment. Well, Bobby got an A because he gets along well with everybody else. Jenny ran around the block the fastest, so she got a three. A principal once said to me, well, we don't give anybody, we give everybody threes because we don't want to hurt their self-esteem. And I said, so it's okay for you to call our kids stupid, but don't call them unhealthy. It didn't make sense to me. Why can't we measure it there? Why are we afraid when it comes to health and wellness to tell somebody you're unhealthy. You need to do that. So ideas to action. We said, we're going to help this. We're going to create two tools. It stood to reason to us. If we wanted to hold our kids and schools accountable to behavior outcomes, they needed to be held accountable. There needed to be some accountability. So the first tool that we developed was a fundamental movement skills tracker. And just like reading, writing and arithmetic, what we said was, in all those subjects, you have a baseline evaluation of where you are, then you get prescribed learning and curricular, they reevaluate you in midterms, and then you're actually assigned a grade based on your progression. It makes common sense. We've been doing it for years. Why not do that for phys ed? There are 34 fundamental movement skills. Let's take the important ones. Let's baseline the kids when they show up at school. Let's show them how to get to the next level and let's make that part of the grade so we can actually quantify and legitimize physical education. Well, this was amazing. We started off with one school, went to two, went to three, went to a different country, another country, country started calling us. We need this tool. Perfect. It's not that hard. Let's get it in there. Fundamental movement skills are skills that are precursors to movement, not just in sport. This is not just about sports. This is life. Running, jumping, throwing, catching, prerequisites in life. We need those to survive. We use those every day. The second thing we did was we looked at some of the healthy habits that we wanted to embrace. And we said, we're going to hold our kids accountable by developing a healthy habit challenge where they get points and they get rewarded for doing good things. They get rewarded for reporting on their activity, reporting on their nutrition, their screen time, their hydration, their sleep, and their mental health. Why would we start giving mental health interventions after we already have a dysfunction or issue? Why not remove the stigma before? We went into schools, oh my God, this is great. Perfect, use the tool. So we started using the tool. Went from one school to another school, all of a sudden different countries started calling us, saying we wanna use this. So ideas into action. That's what it's all about in our own realm, our own circles of influence. We can do it. In the school setting, it must be measured. Go in and ask your school, ask your nephew's school, ask your friend's school, what is your physical literacy strategy? Nine out of ten times, they're not going to be able to give you an answer. And you can go, I heard about something that's really good that you should get, and it's free. So let's do it. The third sector that physical literacy needs to make an appearance is in our society. It's a pile of cocaine. It's a pile of sugar. We already talked about it. They're almost the same. Our society creates addiction because it's very profitable. It's very profitable. 
we create addiction and then we create steps to manage the addiction and then we create new addictions and that cycle keeps going around and around and around. We need to stop that. We need to demand higher quality foods from our fast food companies. And for society to get on board with physical literacy, it's going to require that nasty R word regulation. But for those who think there's no way that's going to happen, the fast food companies and the food companies are way too big to be regulated. Let's not forget some of the big developments that we've had in the Western countries. The blue box, the recycling program. Enough people finally said, it's not okay to destroy our environment. Let's recycle. And we did. And we saved our environment. Everyone recognizes this? Seatbelt. The buckle up program. Not only do we legislate wearing seatbelts mandatory, we, we fine you if you're not doing it. There is accountability. If you do not buckle up, you get fined. Why can't we do the same thing with physical education and physical literacy? We need to start thinking that way. And probably the most familiar to everybody would be this a little pack of generically marked cigarettes. The smoking cessation program, again, in the Western countries, we said it's no longer okay to smoke. We're not doing it anymore. It's no longer okay. And not only do we just say it's not okay, we also have penalties if you do smoke and we have laws and regulations where you can and can smoke. Perhaps it's time for the fast food and the food organizations to experience some of the same compliance incentives as the tobacco companies did. Because the tobacco companies got it because we made them get it. Now physical literacy is a term that is making its way into mainstream conversations. There's been some great documentaries released. One was The Men Who Made Us Fat, which explores the regulation or lack thereof on the food industry in the UK. There was a great documentary called Fed Up, exploring the relationship between high fructose corn syrup and the American diet. And the latest documentary was called Bot, which explores the relationship between genetically modified foods vaccinations and pharma on our children. We're starting to get there. And the reason we're starting to get there is because we just cannot follow the path that we're on. We cannot cure the childhood obesity epidemic by continuing to do what we've always done and expecting different results. It is not going to work. So I call on you in your circles of influence to develop to measure and to promote physical literacy. I call on you to take a couple examples of what we've talked about them today and implement these interventions, not now, but right now. And most importantly, I call on all of you to get moving.